right, everyone. How are you doing? I am Marwan Cameron. Uh, today uh, is the IWW Minute, and you know our host, Sean Macron, is with us. So let me go ahead and give him an applause and bring him on up. Sean, how are you doing today? Uh, now that I've gotten a round of applause, uh, a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> well, fantastic! Is I am I am blessed. I'm feeling good, uh, feeling healthy, and and excited. So, you know, glad that you can be with us and join us and share all the great information that you have. Uh, I was telling you offline a few weeks ago that the newsletter that you put out is phenomenal. And I wish I could get to the point where I could produce, you know, uh, something so valuable uh, for folks to have as a snapshot of what's happening in real time. Oh, thanks for that. And thank you for all the work you're doing with your podcast, like your nonstop shop for all local news. It's really good. We are trying to be. So if anyone ever wants to help out, reach out. But we keep this kind of short. But there's a lot of information to get to, so we're going to jump right in here. Uh, so I'm going to kind of pass it on to you to kind of lead us through this. Yeah, so today we're going to talk about a couple of Supreme Court cases, and then uh, Marwan's got some interesting local news, and then we have some uh, shout-outs. So on uh, the Supreme Court front, uh, something interesting going on. Uh, uh, the the Supreme Court agreed to hear a case um, on whether or not unions can be held liable for intentional damage to property during strikes. Um, it's a union out of Washington State that is actually a party to the lawsuit. And um, for me, the parties don't matter as much. Uh, so I'll get to the rub of it. Um, the big issue is the right to strike and who should be liable for damages and striking. Um, I think it's my position that the right to strike is a free speech issue, a freedom of assembly issue. Um, and any sort of economic deterrent against that uh, is an infringement on free speech. Um, Reading the tea leaves on the Supreme Court, I would expect them to allow unions to be liable for damage to property during strike actions. Um, just because the Supreme Court is a reactionary body that favors property rights, our system favors property rights. And um, it makes sense that if some property gets damaged during an event, um, that the union be held liable but I disagree with it completely. And to give you a sense of how reactionary this Supreme Court is, um, it's a case that uh, scooted by most folks, um, but it's uh, Doe v. Nestle Cargill. And that case uh, involved seven individuals who wanted to sue Nestle, alleging that they'd been forced into child slavery in uh, the Ivory Coast. They claimed they were kidnapped and smuggled from Mali to the Ivory Coast and forced to work at Nestle's cacao plantations uh, against their will. The Supreme Court, in kind of a shocking decision, uh, found against the enslaved workers. Uh, the ground was that they weren't U.S. citizens and there's no way Nestle could have known that they had employees in their corporation working as slaves. Um, wow. Which is just, I mean, I'm an attorney and that's one of the cases, one of the decisions that drove me away from the Supreme Court. And people talk about progressives and there are three progressives on the court and they all voted to deny these enslaved people any day in court, um, which is not really a shocker. I mean, some of the early Supreme Court cases, almost all of them involved slavery and the right for corp for businesses to enslave people. And this Nestle case is just another decision in a long line of <laughs> pro-slavery 
Supreme Court cases. Um, I think it's shocking. What do you think, Marwan, about the strike issue and um, the slavery issue? Well, first off, listening to the story, uh, what's shocking to me is that you're saying, hey, there's three progressive justices that also voted against it. It, it kind of makes you feel like, well, if they're voting against it, who do you have on your side? Yeah, right. Yeah, that, that's pretty alarming to me and, and dismaying. Uh, and then the other thing, too, is, you know, when you do business, uh, it seems like, it, especially here in the States, right, they tell you, uh, and, and I'm, not a, I'm not a lawyer, so correct my, my verbiage here, but it, it doesn't matter if you didn't know you were breaking the law. If you were breaking the law, you're still breaking the law, right? Is that yeah. uh, correct on that? Yeah, you're correct on that. Um, to get into the nuts and bolts of the Nestle decision, they decided it on standing. And standing is just a legal term of art for judges to decide whether or not someone should get to go to court or not. And so um, in this specific instance, all the justices decided these guys, excuse me, had no standing. And standing is just one of the many ways the Supreme Court one of the many tools it has to deny people a redress for grievances. The famous, there's a famous case on standing Lyons, um, the LA, I believe. Mr. Lyons was put in a chokehold by the LA police um, and arrested. After he got out, he wanted to sue the county of LA to prevent that from ever happening again. And the Supreme Court denied him standing to, you know, strip strike down that LA policy that was allowing people to get chokeholded because it was remote remote possibility that he would ever be put in a chokehold ever again. And so he had no standing to sue them. He'd already been put in a chokehold once, likely not gonna happen again, no standing. I think Scalia wrote oh. that one too, rest in, rest in hell. Um, but yeah, that's <laughs> that's one of the many games that they have to, to deny people their rights, standing, oh, you know, and so then they can come up with those crazy counterfactuals like, well, there's no way a company would ever know that they're employing slave people, enslaved people. So there's no there's no liability here. There can be no standing. Um, it's hocus pocus. Well, as you go into your second article, you know, the one the other thing that I would say is, you know, folks will give us the argument, well, you need to change the laws, right? Or these are the laws, right? And uh, the laws work, right? Justice works. It's like, but people are denied justice because they play the game. And so people yeah. don't get their, yeah. their due day in court. And it's like, oh, well, there, there's nothing wrong. Justice is working just how it's supposed to. And it's like, yeah, that's the problem. It's working exactly how it's supposed to. <laughs> yeah. Very yeah. problematic. It is. It's... Um... And it, it begs the question, how much should the Supreme Court be reformed, right? Should we have more justices? Should we put term limits on there? Should we, because Congress could actually override the Supreme Court and give those enslaved folks standing if they want as well. Um, really? So there's, yeah. The Congress could, Cong Congress has a lot of a power to legislate what the courts do. And one of those is they could require the courts to take on certain cases, um, eat away at that power. Let me pull up the next article there. I will say I de definitely agree with the fact that not, there should always be term limits. No one should have lifetime appointments. I think that's very dangerous. Yeah. And, you know, it made sense in 1787 right when life expectancy was really short you put someone on the supreme court for life they're going to be there 10 15 years tops now a life appointment if you're on in your 50, early 40s late 50s early 50s you could be there 30 50 years and society is changing so rapidly it's not fair to generations this current generation to be bound by a bunch of people who are appointed god some of them as long ago as the 80s <laughs> like think well, of how much society's changed since the 80s and now you have judges you know yeah it's just it's not right
it's undemocratic and I am all for more democracy. So what about you, Marlon? Mm -hmm. You had some local news. Oh, I do. So are these, so both of these articles here are on the, the same thing here, correct? Uh, no, the first one was about uh, the Supreme Court is going to be deciding a case on whether or not unions can be held liable for damaged property while going on strike. Um, okay. And then the second article is about the slavery case out of uh, Mali. Gotcha. The way that you said it, it sounded like they both kind of went together, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Well, I think they do. If the Supreme Court is willing to deny people the right a day in court to challenge a corporation enslaving them, you know, what's the likely outcome when they're deciding on whether or not those same workers should be liable for damage to property while while um, striking? You know, I think it's the same side of the same two sides of the same coin. Or, um, I think it. The Cargill case doesn't portend well for the um, the case about strikes, right? Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court is already showing itself to be hostile to labor, hostile to people. So um, I would see it. That makes me think it's more likely that they'll be hostile towards um, unions, which they are, really. <laughs> Supreme Court's yeah, incredibly hostile towards unions. And we got to protect property, not people. Right? Yeah, and you know that's one of the beauties of the IWW is we're willing to strike regardless of what the Supreme Court says. <laughs> you know. So let me jump into my little piece of news. Uh, as everyone uh, probably knows, you know, there was the big event on October 26th uh, to have, uh, you know, community members and, you know, lived experience uh, folks and everyone possible. We casted a wide net as we could to come to the table and talk about the issues on ML King and, you know, specifically restrooms, right, uh, as, as a human right. You know, at the at the minimum, the floor, you know, would be we need a place to use the bathroom in dignity. And, you know, the the force is where well, you're going to use the bathroom outside and then you're going to get a ticket for indecent exposure. Right. That that tends to to be what happens. And so uh, we met. There were a lot of agencies, the foundation for um uh, poverty and homeless management, Salvation Army and City Council, and uh, the housing person from county, um, Northwest Hospitality. A lot of other individuals were there. Folks that were running for election, right? Uh, were there quite a few actually? Um, and so in that, we broke into some groups. Uh, and what I really liked about this, Sean, was we were able to get everyone on common ground. So there were questions about how Salvation Army operates. So we sent out a questionnaire to them. They filled it out. Uh, and then we shared that with everyone. So everyone was on the same page, right? What was myth? What was not myth? Uh, and then one of the captains were present uh, to give more context to, those, the, to the situation. And then we came being solution-oriented. So our focus wasn't to say, you know, you should have done this and this should have been done this way. Because that, you know, I, I think there's a time and place for all that, but I don't think that really would have gotten us anywhere. So it was like, hey, this isn't a place to attack. Here's the problem. We need a solution. So can we work together, please, and find a solution uh, for the people down on ML King? And so we broke into groups and we we did some work. We came back and the group shared it, uh, shared it back out. And we decided to go ahead and reconvene in about two weeks and come up with, you know, uh, a budget for labor, a budget for, you know, equipment uh, for the bathrooms in different places to, you know, put the bathrooms at. Because that's always an issue, right? Is if you present an issue to, to decision makers, they're like, well, what about this? And what about that? And so yeah. what we're trying to do is get past all the whatabouts and say, hey, well, if you, what about this? Here's the answer to that. Well, what about that? Well, here's the answer to this, right? Um, help us, you know, 
And here's how this works. And so it the timing was great because we're in budget time right now for city council and they had their budget meeting and shout out to Jeff Coughlin. Uh, he took that, uh, that is his district. So he took the information from that meeting and advocated and I'll share the email here. And the only reason Jeff, if you watch this is and I'm sharing it is because it came through his city of Bremerton email. So all of this is, is open for FOIA, right? Freedom of Information Act. So this is why I'm sharing it. Uh, otherwise, like if people share emails with me, I just want to be clear. I'm not going to just come up and just, you know, share an email that you sent. With yeah. Me, right. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, <laughs> that'd be uh, great. Today on the podcast, yeah. you read all of our ones private. <laughs> read all about it. <laughs> well, I mean, but it. It's, about, it's about building trust, right? So that's a yeah, quick yeah. way to erode and destroy trust. They said, thank you so much for hosting the meeting yesterday morning and bringing together so many stakeholders of our downtown community for the really productive session. I wanted to report that at tonight's council budget meeting, with the support of my fellow council members, I was able to secure 10000 in the 2023 budget specifically for town MLK area restroom porta potty facility. The budget still has to go through a November 2nd public hearing, a November 9th council study session, and November 16th final public hearing, and a final vote. But I fully expect this amount not will not be reduced, right? So he didn't say it might not be increased. So if our voices are many, we can come and speak. Right? Three opportunities, then the second, the ninth, and the sixteenth. While exact location and other details are to be determined, the council was supportive of the public safety committee working with the community and mayor to figure out those details. Please share this with the stakeholders. And again, my thanks to you and them for the past and future effort of making this happen. I know it's not a large amount, but hopefully it's the start that we can build upon for the future. Cheers, Jeff. So your thoughts on that, Sean? I think that's a fantastic win for the movement. You know, um, I'm excited and thank you for organizing that and getting it all together. And something that, I think my takeaway from it, and this is for the left in general, is there's, you pointed out, there's a time to sit down and talk and there's a time to protest, right? And um, it's very wise and good on you guys to know when to sit down and negotiate and talk and get a win out of it. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's, and I think, you know, the strategies are all of the above. You know, you have to... You got to do all the things. It's just when do you do the things? Yeah, and I think it's good to be contentious maybe with in certain situations um, where that's needed. And then there's when <laughs> there are other times when it's not. And this highlights it perfectly. And to be clear, over at least the past 10 years, there have been folks that have been advocating uh, for these basic rights for the folks down on ML King. Um, and so this is the cumulative effort of the, however long people have been advocating for all the years and pulling it up till now. So I don't want to be singular in, in taking credit. Um, at the end of the day, I'm an organizer, you know, and, and just trying to pull people together and, and leverage the so, social capital that I've built up uh, with each, you know, organization or person. Yeah, we're always standing on someone else's shoulders, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and it's this should be fuel for their whatever's next. You know, we're working on some co-ops, and I know folks are working on social housing. So this is just one step in that direction, and it's a and welcome we need step. Win. Right? Yeah. We need wins. Sometimes we need to win, and that that's great. I definitely look at this as a win. Yeah, and I so, mean, the, the ultimate goal is to get everyone housed, right? But the immediate need right now is that's that's not going to happen for a couple of years. So toilets, things to improve life, whatever we can do is an absolute must. Right. Yeah, because when you look at it, you know, 10 grand, I mean, it might house someone for 10, well, not even 10 months at $1,000 a month if you can find a unit for 1000 right? Yeah. So you provide housing for one person for eight months, maybe, uh, or, you know, you provide bathrooms to 
a hundred and something people down in that quarter, or however many people are down there. Yeah, it's not ideal, but it's the reality we're dealing with right now. Um, and it's a huge win. I think we should celebrate it. We should have a round of applause for that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So thank you to everyone. All right, now you've got a bunch of updates uh, to push us through the next few weeks. Yeah, we're gonna do some updates, and we got to give fellow worker Gordon a shout out. He's not feeling well today, just like I wasn't feeling well all last week. There's a cold going around, um, so we miss you, fellow worker Gordon. Get well. Um, read Feel your Malatesta. Gordon. Yeah, read your Kropotkin and Malatesta, and get better. Uh, so for events on um, this Friday, we're going to have our second People's Assembly hosted by Marwan um, and organized by Joe and I. And it's going to be with uh, Whole Washington's Andre Stock Stackhouse. And the campaign's winding down for this year, so I'm sure he'll have lots of fun stuff to talk about. And then the next day, November 5th at 4 p.m., the Lived Experience Coalition is hosting a pop-up meeting in the uh god on mlk way behind in between the marvin williams center and the salvation army same place food not bombs does its dinners i'll be there with food not bombs serving dinner and helping out with the lec meeting then on 11 12 uh food not bombs is hosting or is having a benefit concert at the charleston theater at 333 north callow avenue there'll be a bunch of groups including the IWW, um, tabling with literature. I've got hundred piece, I've got a <clears throat> hundred pieces of literature coming in from IWW HQ for it. Um, and then on 11, 19th, we're having our third co-op meeting. There's a group of us in Bremerton and in Kitsap County, basically, who formed a committee and we're exploring co-ops for food, housing and, um, recycling. So we're having our next meeting on the 19th. So just um, reach out if you want in on that. Nice. All right. Thank you for that. And if you would, John, will you send that to me, your newsletter, so I can actually put those things in the chat so people can see them? The newsletter. And I don't know how to get the newsletter into the chat. Oh, you, if you want to email it to me, I can let up on my side. Oh, or, yeah. or you've got a private chat there that you can send it to me also. And then while Sean is doing that, I am going to pull, pull this up here. Uh, there is a Bremerton School District superintendent search. Uh, and her voice needs to be part of the conversation, right? This is how we change things is being included in the decision making. This is critical. Uh, so the Bremerton School Board has launched a new formal process to hire the next superintendent of Bremerton School District. We invite you to participate in our stakeholder survey. And the survey is here, www.bremertonschools.org uh, forward slash SUP survey. And I'll go ahead and put that in the captions there uh, so that you can see that. And then uh, it's also in English and in Spanish. So you have that. And so they are inviting you to share your thoughts and to guide the search. Okay. So again, pretty critical here. And when you click in, this is what the survey looks like. So they're asking you, please rate the following organizational characteristics in terms to the degree to which they are currently strengths of the Bremerton School District overall quality of education, student performance, on and on and on, right? So this, uh, the children are our future. Um, there is little short essay questions that you could put in there if you want, and then you hit submit, and it's that easy. So I encourage you uh, to, to do that, please. Also, uh, Resilient Ecosystems. Uh, invites you to their bi-weekly meet and greet. The last one was this uh, on October 29th, which is a Saturday, 9.30 a.m. to 11 a.m. So the next one will be in two weeks. It's every other Saturday at Cups Cafe on Pacific and 4th. And uh, I believe Sean was saying, and I, I feel bad because I'm the president, 
isn't it? <laughs> the classes are right after the meet, meet and greet. So uh, check in with tipping points and puzzle pieces on Wednesday at 1 p.m. And all that information is there. And of course, you can always go to resecho.org for that info. All right. So with that, those are my updates. And then let me go ahead and pull this up. And oh, yeah, I just love your newsletter. So I actually get to show off what I was bragging about Sean producing earlier. So yeah, I, I think this is awesome. I I, I just love this. So uh, here we go. This is what Sean was talking about, the Bremerton MLK mutual aid and then mutual needs. Also, uh, you can drop off uh, donations for folks on ML King down at G2 on 419 Park Avenue and also New Horizons at 4040 Wheaton Way, Suite 203. And here are the current needs. Wet cap food, women's size six shoes, blankets, weather uh, appropriate clothing, both sexes, all sizes, sweaters, sweatpants are particularly needed right now, unisex socks and undergarments for both sexes and sizes. Uh, dry goods like ground coffee, powdered hot cocoa, powdered drink, beans, rice, pasta, bottled water, camping gear like cots, sleeping bags, and tents, feminine care uh, products, and gift cards to Burger King, Starbucks, Safeway, or Amazon, you know, especially places that are close. Um, Food Not Bombs dinners, uh, whole Washington, and labor news. Oh, and around the corner. I see this thing goes on and on. He's producing this every week. Like I, I'm saying, this thing is <laughs> awesome, right? I love this. Uh, and then if you want to get in touch with Sean, he is at S Macarin, M A K A R I N, at mailbox.org, and or phone number 360 471 5982. Yeah. Check out Mark's classes. They're good. Um, any training is a good training if you're trying to build a movement. Yeah, yeah I absolutely love it. Yeah, yeah and I they're a lot last, of fun. Yeah, I spent last Saturday, I put it in the newsletter, last Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, or Saturday and Sunday, at, no, Friday and Saturday at an anti-racist training down in Tequila, and it was a blast. I mean, <laughs> it was just the the sub the main subject was cultural competency like oh nice and trying to untangle a lot of misunderstandings that could be perceived as racist like um common fairly common is how african like worker employers dictating how african americans wear their hair when that's like it's a it's like a cultural thing embedded in history going back thousands of years you know be understanding and just let people wear their, wear their hair the way they want. Um, so it was a lot of fun, but <clears throat> what I think really made it anti-racist is what was, I was doing it with a bunch of other people, you know, mostly minorities. So like, you know, untangling all these, all the trauma and all these misunderstandings and becoming culturally competent with a bunch of other people was really the highlight. That's great. I got one more update that I just wanted to share with people. Um, we uh, do have a uh, partnership with the uh, Kids App Long Term Aging and Care. So, if anyone needs to, if you're disabled or elderly, uh, if you need to get vaccinated or get a booster, you can give us a call, and that transportation is free. And what we try to do is just maximize your time and effort. So. You need to go to the grocery store, you know, try to do those things at the same time. So let us try to maximize it for you. We do have a uh, disabled van, so we that's wheelchair accessible. And then last Friday, we just purchased our first 15 passenger van. So that is now part of the fleet. Uh, so we're very blessed for that. So we look forward to getting that out on the road and uh, serving the community. So just wanted to share that little piece of news there. Now we need to put a mural on the van now. Yes, <laughs> but those things aren't cheap, so maybe we need to do a campaign for that. Yeah, <laughs> find some. We need some young, enterprising artists who want to help make yeah. an impact. Oh, that'd be kind of cool, huh? Yeah, yeah, I like that idea. All right. All right. So any final words? No, other than rest. Take care, Gordon. Uh, solidarity forever.
Absolutely. All right. So for Sean Macron and for Gordon, who is normally here with us, I am Marwan Cameron. This is the IWW Minute or the IWW, IWW I like, Weekly. I like the minute. The minute? All right. Yeah. So then I think that's the name then, IWW Minute. So <laughs> from here on out, that is what we will refer to it, and we will see you next week.